Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this evening's keynote speaker. It gives me pleasure to welcome Lee Chase. He leads the Security Intelligence and Ops Consulting Competency for IBM Security, UK and Ireland. Within this role, he leads development of new tools and techniques for security intelligence gathering, processing and reporting. So let's sit back and enjoy uh, Quantum and the mainframe. And if you haven't seen Devs, it's on iPlayer. Uh, and I'm sure this has got absolutely nothing to do with Devs. So thank you, Lee, over to you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you. I uh, appreciate the introduction. I should just say that um, I fear we may have a slightly out of date um, job description for me, but that's okay. Yeah, it's more or less the same sort of thing. Same song, slightly different words. However, um, so yes, my name is Lee Chase. I'm a computer scientist within IBM Research. So I look after some of the work we do in uh, scientific computing, in cybersecurity areas like this. Uh, but I also work, and it's largely in this role that I'm talking to your good selves this evening, uh, is part of our quantum ambassador group in the UK. And uh, now that's really a, a team of people who are not working on the fundamental science of quantum computing, but it is working on the exploitation of that. So what do I mean by that? How do we help people understand quantum? What does it mean? Is it relevant? So over the next uh, six or seven hours that I'm going to be talking to you for the remainder of the day, uh, we're going to get through quite a lot of material. Um, and I think the way we've got this set up is such that if you do have questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them throughout. And it's, I want you to get from this session as much as you can. We do have quite a lot of material to get through, and I'm not at all going to be dogging the manger about getting through all of that. So if there's a particular area that interests us, let's, uh, let's, let's take it from there. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll do a very brief introduction. So I started, so that's me on the left. Uh, yes, I am that tedious to have taken my um, IBM uh, badge with me on holiday when I went to the Cape Canaveral Center there, which is the ground control um, mission systems for the Apollo missions. Um, so I, I'm a self, uh, well, a very proud IBM geek, I think it's fair to say. Um, but I, I started out here working on uh, ZX Spectrum. That's where I started out doing my coding. Uh, and then I moved to the IBM PCXT. And then on the right hand side there, some of you may recognize this, that's an IBM R6000 SP1. To be more specific, it was my IBM R6000 SP1 that I had when I was at university. I was doing mathematical modeling, things of that nature, um, which meant I had to get rid of all my dining room furniture and shared house. Uh, so that was a, a logarithmic decline in popularity with everyone I know. However, a ra you know, roaringly good compute platform. Uh, also has to get a gas cooker put in because we had to run it off the 30 amp ring though, uh, which was previously used for the cooker. So the reason I'm telling you that is it tells you a little bit about me, which I hope will frame uh, the level of nonsense you're going to get from me over the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, but it's my pleasure these days to work on these sorts of systems, so quantum systems. And what we're going to cover in, in, in this little session is talk a little bit about quantum technology, why it's relevant, but explore some of the things that perhaps you aren't familiar with with quantum. Um, so we'll get on to that in a second. Um, there are some similarities between my old RS6000 and quantum systems, as, as they now are, in that both of them turn problems that I do understand uh, into answers that I don't, very much leading me here, which is this sort of uh, endlessly curious position of trying to figure out what it is I've done, why it's relevant and why it's useful. Um, but what I'd like to get onto is, is what are these things, how are they relevant? What does that mean for mainframe? How does that fit alongside mainframe? I should say I'm also a massive mainframe geek. So um, I think we should have quite a lot to talk about. So what does all this mean? What is quantum computing? Why does it matter? Does it matter? There's a, this is an area that's been talked about quite a lot in the last few years, uh, not just from the IBM side, but obviously industry is, we are starting to see realized quantum computation. So in literal terms, you could say, this is quantum computing. So this is the IBM System 1Q. This is a nine by nine by nine borosilicate glass box, which contains all of the bits and pieces, including the electronic control equipment uh, and the dilution refrigeration system that contains the computer itself, which is the shiny sort of bean can hanging from the center. But I think that's a relatively low dimensional view of what computing really is. It, we could also say that literally it's this, it's experimentation, it's scientific discovery, it's, it's all of things of this nature. Um, we could also say, oh, okay, well, maybe it's things that we run in labs, maybe it's dedicated equipment. But I would ask the same sort of question is that we need to dig deeper because there's a temptation to have a superficial view of, of quantum computing and what that means and why it's relevant. And I'd like to get into a bit more depth around that. We could ask the same thing of the mainframe. So if we said, what is a quantum computer? We could talk about it in literal terms. Yes, it's a thing. Yes, it does computing type things. But we could say, well, actually, what is a mainframe? Why does it matter? Why is that important? 
And to me, yes, it can start here. We can talk about central data processing services. We can talk about the evolution of these sorts of systems. And this is sort of where we are with quantum today. But is a mainframe purely this? Or is it purely this? Is it a, this is a Z15? Is it just a box? Is it something that does you know, um, transaction processing? Is it something that does HR and payroll systems? Is it, is it just, just that? Or is it this? Is this what we mean by a mainframe? And I think the answer to all these things is, well, yeah, but also no, uh, which is a classic consulting answer. And uh, for those of you familiar with any sort of quantum theory, as you might think this is an in gag, this idea of things being both yes and no at the same time. But it's true. Because yes, quantum computing is, is a device that does the sorts of things we'll come on to discuss. And yes, mainframes are devices that provide transaction processing systems. But the reality is that there's so much more than that. And that's what I'd like to get to with quantum is that it's in the same way that the mainframe is not just a system, it's, it's banking. It's transaction processing for electronic fund transfer, which at the moment, because of the way that we currently live with lockdown is it's emphasized in our minds the importance of a global settlement system that doesn't require us to be anywhere physical but we can still conduct our business we can get food we can support the things that need us so mainframe is about enablement mainframe is about underpinning services which are vital not just to certain industries but to us as people and i think that matters mainframe is also transaction processing and and, and workloads for things like weather data agriculture as we see these diversified workloads come into a sort of hybrid cloud model. And that's where we see mainframe going. So it's again, it's not just financial services and it's not just these things. And it's sure as hell, not just, you know, tin and string and flipping bits on the wire. It's so much more than that. So in the same way that mainframe is more than, more than just the sum of its components, it's what we can do with it. And so it goes with quantum. It's about computing and computing is really about people because technology doesn't really have problems. Technology leads to problems and technology supports people in modeling the problems. And this is what it really comes down to. So in the same way that mainframe is about those technologies, those services that underpin our lives, that are so vital to us, whether that's healthcare, whether that's financial services, whether that's just the basic things we have to do in developed nations yeah, to, to, to live our lives and to support other developing nations in living theirs, Quantum is so much more than just an experimental science project. It's so much more than just another computing paradigm. It's an opportunity to think differently, not just about the nature of, of, of how we apply it, but to the very, very nature of computing itself. And I love this quote, this idea that computing is really no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. And if I, there's a jolly good chance, by the way, you won't remember anything that I say to you in the, say the next six or seven hours that we're, we're spending the evening together. Um, but if you do have to remember something, I'd really implore you to remember this, which is quantum computing is just another part of, of, of computer science. It allows us a different vocabulary, a different way of thinking to model problems, to explore problems, and hopefully to solve problems in a way that's compelling and problems that really matter in the world. And as a research scientist, that's what motivates me as somebody who is interested in new problems. And it, it interests me as having um, new kit in the kit bag, I suppose, new ways of solving these problems. And that's hugely important. And really, I suppose it all starts here. It starts with complexity. Uh, some of you will be familiar with this, this idea of com the computational complexity classes. This is where um, computer science is about problems, right? So it's really about how we articulate problems and how through algorithms, how uh, through processing, we can uh, instrument those problems and hopefully find solutions to them. And this is re really where we get to. So the reason that quantum computing is relevant in this is that it's not about solving problems which are uh, NP hard, right? Because an NP hard problem is an NP hard problem. In other words, a problem for which there is no, no known low order polynomial time solution to that, which can be arrived at um, uh, independently or arbitrarily. So it has to be either provided or we just have to be jolly lucky. My experience is not that lucky. <laughs> um, but the idea is, is that as we can start to think about complexity, we need to think about how it relates to a world beyond classical mechanics. And this, ladies and gents, I genuinely feel is one of the most interesting areas in computer science at the moment is how do we move from a world dominated by classical von Neumann machines, which are largely just an implementation of, of, of uh, universal Turing machines bounded by classical logic to one that takes a broader view, one that allows us to think about not just the technologies we're using, but the very nature of how we instrument problems and how we describe them and how we solve them differently. And to me, that's enormously exciting because what I really care about is having the tools to do my job. And my job, IBM pays me to do is solve problems and build stuff. 
uh, hopefully in that order. Um, I am prone to building stuff and then thinking about what problem it might solve later, but I'm gonna have to play the I'm a programmer, not a software engineering card at that point. So we need to think about, okay, what does it really mean? So we talked jovially about how it relates to existing platforms and, and make us think slightly differently about you know, what mainframe means, what, what quantum means, but let's give some actual technical context to what quantum computing is. And in a nutshell, quantum computing is artificially similar to classical computing, but with some very subtle but important differences. And the important difference is that classical machines arrange information as bits. So our unit of information, our unit of work is really the bit, you know, binary digit. And we apply to those bits, we string them together as arrays, as registers, as structures, memory data structures, and we apply logic gates to those through transistor circuitry, through other means, if it's uh, unconventional computing. But ultimately what we're trying to do is store information, apply operations through logic circuits and logic gates um, to that information, and then we yield an output. And then we do stuff with that output, stuff being of course the technical term for what users then do with it, which as a computer scientist means it's outside where I meet, my remit. Once they run the algorithms, good luck to them. I do, of course, jest, but in quantum computing terms, we are changing the, the nomenclature of this. So in the same way that classical machines use this sort of classical information theory, the um, binary digits, um, and they use classical mechanics within the implementation of those logic circuits, quantum computing is doing the same, but with quantum analogs. So we move from having quantum bits, sorry, from having bits to, to quantum bits, and from logic gates, classical logic gates, to quantum logic gates. And the way that we tend to think about it at the moment, this is a highly developmental area, is um, circuit diagrams or circuits, if you like, algorithm, algorithms or circuits. These are uh, computationally as, as complete as a, as a Turing machine would be, but perhaps a more intuitive representation. So when we talk about, and we will come onto this in a few minutes, but when we talk about building quantum algorithms, in other words, algorithms that run on a quantum computer, we are really just talking about the same principles as classical machines, but with, with a different, um, different spin to them, no pun intended. So um, we're still representing information, we're still applying logical gates, and we're still applying uh, operations to, to achieve some outcome uh, as defined by the algorithm. And the important part to this, of course, is that um, the way that this works is, is we have to think differently. And I'm afraid the bad news here is that if you take your Let's say you've got some really hot shot parallel algorithms that run jolly well on Z. If you then think, oh, and actually, this is a really hard problem. Maybe this, you know, quantum computing science, there's something in this that could improve the quality of that workload. So we're going to take that existing algorithm. Um, we're going to port the socks off it until it's working properly on quantum. Lamentably, the absolute best case scenario is uh, it's going to be no better. And you might be thinking, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Why have you spent billions of dollars and some of the finest minds ever to work in our company uh, have been dedicated to this? Why have you invested in that if it's no better? And I'm afraid it's worse than that, is that it will probably be a lot worse. But the trick, of course, is, is that it's a bit like learning a new language, is that it's one thing to understand the symbols. It's another thing entirely to really be able to converse in the language. And that's where we end up with this idea of uh, quantum native. I'm sorry, that's a horrible phrase. But what I mean by that is, if we want to solve problems with quantum computers, the power of it arrives not from the ability to take classical models of the world and apply them on a quantum system, it's to build quantum models of the world. So we have to use this as a new tool to not just try and run our, our, our algorithms as a, as a runtime, but to think differently about how we structure that. And I suppose there are some, again, there's some read across the mainframes here is that if you were just to take a, you know, reduced instruction set workloads and say, right, we're going to run them on, on Z CPUs, that's not the right way to do it because you don't get the same level of optimization. You're not using the memory management systems properly. You're not making the best of the optimizations within the, EC, uh, within the operating systems and so on and so forth. And, and quantum has similar properties. So just as mainframe as developers requires us to think of it differently, in quantum, we have to do so even more so because we don't have the maturity in the technology and therefore the layers of abstraction that we've built in Z over many, many years. And personally, I find this enormously exciting because this is a chance to really be in on the ground floor of something which requires us to, uh, to think as computer scientists differently and then as application developers and as users and as, and as systems integrators. So it all hangs together rather nicely. So a bit of history, where's it all come from? So. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, although quantum is a very, very new technology in terms of its exploitation, this is something IBM has been working on for four decades. Um, so this picture was taken at uh, MIT in 1981, 
and this contains uh, this was from the um, a, a, a physics and com computational science workshop where the idea is that they were talking sort of about the idea of building models of the world and it was Feynman who if you can see my mouse pointer is here this is Richard Feynman um, said and I paraphrase golly gosh darn it if you're going to build models of the world you ought to make them quantum because that's how the world really works I mean what's nice about that is it, this was actually before the release of the, the IBM PC notionally. So we are talking about a, some, some relatively well-established ideas, I think now. Um, but there's some you know, pretty sub substantial people. So uh, Freeman Dyson is here. And this chap here um, is uh, Rolf Landauer, who is, or was at the time, an IBMer. Um, and he was actually responsible in some part for bringing all these people together. So this idea of quantum computing came out of this, this sort of physics view of the world. And what's so groundbreaking about this is so many of the ideas that we're going to talk about and we're going to show in the next few minutes uh, were science fiction, but a short number of years ago. And if that doesn't excite us as technologists, I frankly, I'm, I think we might be in the wrong industry. <laughs> um, and I, for me, the idea that we've taken the work of... And, these are genuinely some of the finest people who ever thought of these sorts of things. And we are building on that. We are now implementing those things and we are starting to see real world, practical, tractable use cases. And not just in sort of trivial areas, but in areas that are gonna matter. And what I mean by matter is these are not just sort of self-fulfilling things. These are taking on genuinely challenging, genuinely uh, tricky, important workloads that matter for humanity. And we'll talk a bit about what some of those are. Um, so let's start off with something really important, which is cheese sauce. Now, I'm sure any quantum computing discussions you've had before tends to centre on culinary sciences. Um, but please do bear with me. So one evening, there I am making uh, a cheese sauce. And this is actually a true story. Um, and there's an optimum viscosity for cheese sauce, but you don't want it to be too thick, nor do you want it to be too runny. In other words, you have to keep stirring it. And as you extract the whisk from the saucepan, it builds this cone of cheese, of, of, of uh, a developmental primordial cheese sauce, if you like between the whisk and between the remainder of the liquid in the pan, um, or plasmas, it tends to be my experience of making cheese sauces, but that's an aside. But this, this cone that it creates, of course, is a minimum energy system. Now, if I was to build a computational fluid dynamics model of this, um, and frankly, why wouldn't we want to? Uh, we'll come on to the open foam modeling of cheese sauce in a separate lecture. Um, but if I was to do that, I would require a serious amount of compute horsepower. And you think, well, actually, that leads us to an absurd conclusion, which is, if it requires a huge amount of, of horsepower in something like um, you know, IBM's HPC systems at you know, Lawrence Livermore or Oak National, you know, Oak Ridge, these sorts of places, then surely you, you, can, you can sort of reducto ad absurdum. You can say, well, has it got more, has the cheese source got more computational power um, than the HPC infrastructure? And of course, no, it doesn't, that's nonsense. But the power of the cheese source derives not from the disease modeling what a cheese source would do, it is powerful because it is a cheese source. And so it goes with quantum computing. So the power of quantum computing comes not from its capacity to simulate quantum effects, but it's in, it is those quantum effects. So it comes from not uh, simulation, it comes from instantiation. And this is incredibly important because when we start thinking about different types of workloads, so take, for example, resistant materials, drug development, um, crystallography, computational chemistry, n-body simulations more generally, combinatorial optimization, workloads of this type, which have a real meaning in the world, whether that's financial services, whether that's drug discovery for, for healthcare, whether that's for heavy industry um, and sustainable materials, things like this. The ability for us to harness compute workloads, sorry, uh, compute platforms, which are more optimized for these workloads is fantastic. You know, that has to be where the industry is going, that, because that really allows us to move forward. So to give you an idea of a, of a basic example of where this takes us is, let's think about caffeine. Um, many of us, I suspect, are coffee drinkers. My experience of working with scientists and technologists is that, is that that tends to be the case. Um, and if you'll indulge me, Paul Erdos, the Hungarian mathematician, I believe it was his assistant who is on the record as saying that a mathematician is a machine that turns coffee into theorems, which I always thought was rather nice. Um, but if we take caffeine, which I'm not a chemist, but my, my friends and colleagues who are would tell me this is not considered a complex molecule. Um, but to model that in any way, since, uh, any way useful requires in the order of 10 to the 48 bits. So in other words, it becomes a very large search base very quickly. And you immediately think, well, how can something so small become so complex? And obviously, once we start thinking about, in the case of other types of uh, molecular analyses, 
things like development of new materials. So alloys containing uh, 15 or 16 base elements with different levels of ionization, things like this. And at the moment we're thinking one qubit to one electron isn't a bad ratio. So you can see that the scalability of this is, is, is crazy. So you know, 10 to the 48 looks like that. Um, lots of bits, so many large, so many bits, we've drawn it in blue, just to really highlight the point. Slightly passive aggressive, I know, but please do bear with. Um, but if you were to model that in terms of atoms of the earth, you know, you're talking a non-trivial slice. So the purpose of me explaining this to you is that this isn't a horsepower problem, right? So this isn't about, oh, okay, well, we just need faster classical machines. We need a faster horse. Um, we need more Hertz. We need more CPU, we need more memory. It's not about that. It's that there are some problems which we know exceed the boundaries of what will ever be considered tractable in classical mechanics. And that's a really important point, yeah? So it isn't horsepower, it's, there are things which we are at the very limits of. And these aren't you know, highly theoretical notional problems. These are things which are gonna block us. Um, and if we take the view that yeah, a society is increasing reliant on technology, we have to have that technology working for us as, as effectively and, and on our side, we need to harness other models of computation to do this. And that's where quantum computing really comes into its own. So quantum computing is not going to replace mainframe for things like transaction processing. It's not going to replace conventional tin for running file print email, that kind of stuff. It's not, that's not what it's about. This is about a future where quantum computing forms part of a broader multimodal computing platform that's optimized to do different things. So we talked a bit about bits and qubits and we can start to unpick a little bit about the power of quantum computing it comes down to and um, this sort of notion is two things, really. It's those, those gates that we talked about, and we'll come on to that in a second. But it really starts at this. It starts at the qubit. And the qubit, the quantum bit, is the fundamental unit of information. It's our basic unit. It is to quantum computers what the bit is to classical computers. But unlike classical bits, it has this unusual property, which is, and you'll see, um, so this thing on the right here, this guy, this is called the, the block sphere. Now, I'm not a physicist. So this is, to me, a not a terribly useful representation because um, it is derived from physics. And this is all to do with expressing the state of a quantum system. Now, each qubit is itself a quantum system. Um, I know you might think, hang on a second, I've got qubits that are qubits that, so that are quantum systems within a quantum system. This sort of sounds like the MC Escher painting of, of, of computational science. Um, and you'd be right. There is a certain circularity to that. Uh, no pun intended because we're dealing with spheres. But this idea that... Um, classical bits are only ever in one of, one of two states. Yeah? So they're in a zero state or they're in a one state. But with quantum bits, not so. It has this unusual property, which because of these quantum mechanical phenomena, that we have what we call the basis states. And that's what we have here. This is called Dirac notation or bracket notation, um, where we have this state. So we've got a zero state and a one state. So in other words, it actually you know, there's some value within the system that subscribes um, to such that we, we subscribe a zero or a one to that. But because of the, the, the quantum mechanical component to it, we have this idea of superposition as well. So it's actually, it's in the zero states in the one state, but it's in a evenly distributed superposition of both zero and one whilst it's in use. And that final caveat to that's really important because the kicker with quantum systems, unlike things like mainframe is that when at runtime, you, when it's running, you can't inspect the state of it because by doing so, you collapse it into a discrete state. So you force it into a classical view of the world because that's how we're interacting with it. Whereas with a mainframe, theoretically, you can at any point inspect all of the registers. And I appreciate there's encryption and you can so on and so forth that has to be considered. But you take the point that at any time I could look at main memory, I could look at swap, I could look at disk, I could look at CPU, I could go right down to the register level. I could look at what current situation uh, is going on within the CPU in terms of transistors. And I would be able to arrive at some machine state without forcing it to stop executing. Not so with quantum. But this superposition gives a very unusual property, which is... It allows us to encode information, if you like, more densely than we can with classical machines. So with the classical machine, we have this, as I say, everything's in a discrete state, but we actually see two to the n uh, representation uh, st uh, states within qubits. So this exponential growth where n qubits will give us two to the n basis states. So in other words, it's, it, it's a very dense way of packing that in a way that um, it's it's not right to say it's, it, it, it's, a it's more efficient, um, but it's right to say that because of these qualities that it, it's just a higher dimensional problem. It, it's got a higher resolution, if you like, because we're measuring different things. 
than we are purely with conventional basis states. Um, I should also say that we talked about zeros and ones and other bits and pieces, but these are all complex states as well. So these are uh, values to find on the complex plane. So it's not all real numbers. Uh, it's the real and the imaginary component of that. So it's a very, very, uh, it's a very dense way of expressing information, but ultimately is this is where quantum information science becomes very important. So we'll come back to that in just a second, but we'll, we'll talk a bit about gates for a moment in that just as we have um, classical gates in, in classical machines, so ands, ors, xors, things like that, we have corresponding gates um, within, the, uh, within the quantum machines. But coming back to our block sphere for a moment, um, these gates effectively operate on the axes of the block sphere. So we have three axes here, um, x and y and z, and as a consequence of the way this works is that any state within the qubit can be expressed by a, or measured as a point on the block sphere. Um, and effectively, that state is determined by which gates that we apply to it. So in IBM terms, we actually have systems that do this, actually physical quantum computers, and that we implement these gates within the processors. And effectively, when we're programming for them, we're arranging these gates much as we would um, for classical machines, but at a, at a much lower level. So the expectation for building quantum algorithms at the moment is requires you to be a lot deeper um, than you would be, let's say, if you were just developing Reg, reg, for regular machines. Um, but the two that are most famous, of course, fame in quantum computing terms is a very much a relative thing, um, is what's known as the Adamard gate and the controlled knot gate. And the Adamard gate is what gives us superposition. Um, so this is the idea that things can be in this quasi probability distribution rather than in just discrete states, which is a key part of the power of quantum information science. And then we have the controlled knot gate, which is um, it's a, again, it's, a, it, it's one of the most common gates used in computing, but effectively it has a bit um, which when the state of that bit will determine the, the basis state of the target bit. So the control bit is the bit that we're operating on and the target bit changes according to the value of the control bit. Um, so if the control bit is a one, typically um, if and only if it's a one, then the, the, the state of the target bit will be flipped. Um, so irrespective of what the value of the target bit is, if it's a one in the control bit, it will flip the state of the other one. Now, I know this sounds very, very low level. You might be thinking, good grief, I thought we'd come on a long way from here. Um, we were doing this in the 50s and 60s. And I, I think that's a fair characterization, actually. But this is the level we currently need to think of, is that when we're building quantum um, algorithms, we're really building quantum circuits. And if we're really building quantum circuits, what we mean is, uh, an assemblance of bits, an assemblance of gates, an assemblance of output bits. Um, the one quirk is, is that, of course, we read all of this into classical memory, uh, into classical bits, because once we've done the work and it's collapsed, frankly, we can encode the state very efficiently. Um, but just, just to pick up on those two qualities again very quickly, just so, just so you're aware, is um, superposition. We talked about this idea of um, two to the n combinations uh, evenly distributed, but then entanglement. Uh, entanglement, I'm afraid, is where it starts to get a tad weird, I think is probably the right way to put it. But entanglement, again, is this quantum mechanical property that um, when I influence, if I have two entangled systems, in this case qubits, when I influence one, it has a corresponding influence on another. And that's a really important point, because this combination of superposition and entanglement really is what gives uh, much of quantum computing its promise, I think, in terms of the information science component. Um, so we're going to come up a little layer from there because I'm conscious that for those of you who are still awake and I applaud you, um, is you are probably thinking a mm, little, bit, little bit down in the weeds. So uh, let's talk about the elephant in the room, a virtual room, of course, and a socially distanced elephant. Um, but you might be thinking all of this sounds roaringly good as a research project, but isn't it just that? Isn't this just sort of well, tomorrow's technology and like all good emerging technology projects, when people say, how long will it take? And you say, five years. And then in five years, they say, how long will it take? And you say, five years. Um, because the correct response to any research question is uh, more research is required. <laughs> um, and I say that very much as a researcher. But the elephant in the room here is, this is where are we with all of this stuff? And the reality is we are here. We have, we have had available since 2016, IBM has made available um, free to use public uh, machines. So real world physical quantum computers. And what you're seeing on the right hand side here, the picture is actually a picture I took of a model of a system, but the model is made of decommissioned parts of a real quantum computer. It seems slightly absurd to me um, that in 2020, I can be talking about the fact that we're decommissioning systems. And this was actually from Think last year. 
So what you're seeing here is a is what's inside that. Earlier on, we had that uh, that shiny bean can thing that I showed you. This is what's inside it. So you have a dilution refrigeration system within here that goes from about five or seven Kelvin uh, up at the top here down to about 15 millikelvin at the bottom. So very very close uh, to absolute zero. And this is required because the technology that we use is what's called uh, transmission line shunted plasma oscillation, which uses superconducting aluminium niobium within the core. And as a consequence of that, for, to, for, for superconductivity in these materials, it has to be super, super cooled. Um, and the reason that the bean can goes over the top of it isn't just about obviously controlling the temperature, but it's controlling stray fields as well. So this thing has to be damp from the environment, which is why it's hanging from a gantry. So real operational systems have to be absorbed because they're incredibly sensitive um, to interference, but not just interference in terms of somebody you know, turning up and falling over it or something, um, but it's also stray fields and even a stray photon within there would cause potential decoherence and an increase of error rates and so on and so forth. So it's, you know, I, again, if you go away from this stuff thinking, oh, it's all hocus pocus, please, please don't, because we've got to a stage where we're not just releasing these things, but we've got different families of systems that we're developing with slightly different architectures or different topologies within the processes. And you can see on the right hand side, uh, far right hand side, where it says IBMQ um, Santiago from Athens and so on and so forth. These are all systems which I screenshotted today. Um, and you can see that there are genuine jobs going on in each of those um, as usefully highlighted by uh, purple bars. Um, but um, you, these things are really running. Right? And if you are at all interested in this stuff, please get stuck in. Um, please have a look because it's an enormously exciting area and it's free to use. If you've got yourself an IBM ID, and frankly, who hasn't? Um, get yourself logged on. I should also say it's not just us. You know, Google are looking at this, Getty are looking at this, lots of people are looking at this. And coming back to the point we we're making about you know, the importance of mainframe, the importance of technology and at the start of the session, this is, this is technology for humanity because it's taking us forward. It will allow us to do things in, in those areas we talked about, drug discovery, crystallography, things of that nature. And these really matter. So where's the technology going? So at the moment, this is very, very early on um, in terms of its life cycle. So what we're really talking about is these, what we call noisy intermediate scale devices or NISCs. Um, and that's what we're working with. And uh, there's a, I'm afraid we all fall into the my dad's bigger than your dad argument when it comes to computing technology, which is, ah, the bigger numbers typically are the better unless we're talking about latency. Um, but computational power within quantum computing terms is, is more adequately described in terms of quantum volume. And what we mean by this is that power is not just a function of the number of qubits as an abstract scalar value, it's how we deal with the error rate as well um, and how we can stack those things up. So we end up with this idea of quantum volume really is the number of bits required to solve problems with this type of search space when modeled using quantum information science. So coming back to the, the way that we were talking about a few minutes ago of how we encode our problems and how we think about um, that sort of expansion, that two to the n expansion, um, when we implement that in real systems, that because of the noise within the environment, these are analog computing devices, right? These are very you know, physical systems. So we have to have, at the moment, this idea of more qubits than, than we require to, to build the spaces, but this idea of quantum volume is just how we express the computational power of the devices. So I'm afraid, like with all things with quantum, it's never quite as simple as it sounds. Um, but it's, you know, and, and over time, there's a little GIF on here, hopefully it'll, it'll play. And you can see what's happened is we've built this quantum volume over time, and that's ramped up considerably since the first versions of the systems we launched back in um, 2016. And we've now got sort of seven backends and with different quantum volumes, but you'll notice um, that these things have different topologies. Yeah? Um, and those different topologies are really predicated on this idea that at the moment, um, we have to wire the systems differently. There's, there, there are different ways of connecting those qubits together. And again, because this is a very developmental, it's very emerging technology, the programmer has to be mindful of this. And the reason they have to be mindful of this is you can't, not everything's connected just to everything else. You can't just apply gates in a purely sort of abstract, um, hardware abstracted way. Um, we don't yet have that full hardware abstraction shim. Um, so the programmer still needs to think about the topology of the environment in which they're going to run it. But that's great because we're still at that stage where we're developing runtimes for the first time. So having people who understand that sort of from soup to nuts, if you like, component to it, I think is really important. So let's think about that from the programmer perspective just for a couple of minutes. And I promise you, we, we will close more or less on time. Um, but this idea that this is all great, this is all wonderful, all sounds very science fiction-y, brilliant. But what does this really mean to me as a programmer? When do I fire up Vim? When do I start writing code? Uh, which are the two questions I start my 
every day, I should say. Um, so I suppose that the most important part of this is that there's a large number of algorithms that are starting to be developed now, this growing set of techniques which people can reuse. Now, um, things like, you know, we talked about crystallography and, and um, aspects, you know, roles within financial services, but also things like machine learning uh, within cybersecurity. And we're starting to see people develop these. Um, some of it's led by IBM Research, but it's mainly community driven. Um, so we see things like, this is one example, the variational quantum classifier that would obviously be used in, in quantum oriented machine learning and generative adversarial networks as well. So if anyone's used this, there's the idea of using um, neural networks to compete with each other against some predefined notion of fitness. Um, so this QGAN these, and VQCs, these are quantum native versions of these. And once we scale out the quantum volume, we can start applying these at scale because we know the algorithms to be good and we can continue to, re to, to refine them. Again, fame, as I say, is a, is a relatively um, uh, yeah, relatively questionable thing in quantum terms, I think. But perhaps the most famous algorithm at the moment is Grover's search algorithm. So this is something that, that affords in the order of quadratic improvement in search-based complexity, time complexity, when running those algorithms. So why is this relevant? Well, anybody who does search, which is pretty much anybody who has a database, which is pretty any enterprise, um, will be interested in this. So think about how we currently use different types of workloads and different types of virtual machines or different types of container orchestration environments to solve different things. In the future, we may need to think about different types of computing platform to do that as well. So we may have indices within our databases which are optimized against Grover search algorithm which require execution on a quantum computer, for example. Um, it's a trivial example and probably not practical, but you get the picture. This idea of a more, um, I suppose, uh, a broader view of, of, of computing platforms. And then again, on the right hand side, the variation of quantum eigensolver, and this is all to do with matrix arithmetic. Um, very, very commonly used in resistant materials and drug discovery and body simulation, things like this, which are the big workloads. Uh, we then have approximation and support vector machine. So the support vector machine, again, that's largely used in machine learning. It's to do with finding um, separability, uh, discrimination within data sets. So understanding where you can discriminate between one group of things, another group of things. So boxes that are red, boxes that are blue, things that are triangles, things that are circles, um, things like that. And again, interesting work if you're a, a data scientist or a machine learning person. Um, but again, and more generally, the, the approximation work for things like finding max cut, so on and so forth. This is, you can see this is you know, obviously very big in graph computing and we know that's having a bit of a renaissance at the moment. So there really are practical things that, that we can start to deliver. And these are just sort of off the shelf, if you like, um, in the open source algorithms. If you want to get going on this stuff yourself, three easy pieces, as there always are with things uh, concerning Feynman. Um, but you then, you know, IBM has built the quantum experience where you can do in-browser development of quantum circuits, but we've also presented APIs. So the machine that I talked to you about earlier and all those back ends, um, there's API access to those as well. So you don't have to use the, the, the tools purely through the cloud. If you want to run them in a Jupyter notebook, there's a Python SDK. So we can step into sort of regular languages and we can do you know, different types of representation around that. So pushing things around as JSON and, and then everything gets transpiled down um, across, I should say, into this thing called Open Chasm, which is a quantum assembly language, which is pretty much what it sounds actually. It's just a lower level machine style syntax, uh, but it's Turing complete. Um, and what that allows us to do is take circuits which are created through the quantum experience, through Python, through other SDKs, and then uh, optimize them and then build them in, in this Chasm language. Um, now, what then happens on the right-hand side is, is the funky bit, if you'll uh, excuse the expression. So the funky bit consists of a simulated topology. So we actually ship an open source simulator. So if you want to run that, you can yourself on your own machine. But we also host via the quantum experience a simulator up to the order of 32 qubits, because beyond that, it's not really classically uh, simulatable, if that's the right phrase. <laughs> Apologies for the verb. Um, but then you have the real topology. So we talked a bit about the quantum volume and the different um, backends that we've got at the moment. So so you know, quite last year, we IBM published the fact that we'd got a 53 qubit machine. Um, and obviously, we've since published things about our, our roadmap, which we'll come on to towards the end is where we're taking our current uh, generation of quantum processors. So you can actually, you can define these backends with, with your code, and then you can run them. And again, that doesn't have to be done through the browser. It can all be done within your Jupyter Notebook or within your Python client or whatever you're using uh, via the SDK. Um, so this is Qiskit. So Qiskit is the SDK that sits around all of this. And again, just to be absolutely clear, although we developed this with the IBM systems in mind, again, it's, it, 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 there has been work on running this on other universal machines. 
uh, what we mean by universal quantum machines, by the way, is um, rather than annealers or sort of analogs of quantum machines, these are uh, quantum systems that can run any quantum algorithm notionally, providing, you know, notwithstanding things like uh, volume and so on and so forth. But if you can build a quantum algorithm, you need a universal quantum machine to know that you can run it. Otherwise, things like annealers will run subsets, which are very powerful, you know, useful machines. But IBM is very much in the universal quantum computing area. And that's why Qiskit, um, and this is just a screenshot of the web page, so you can, you can search for this. Um, and you can download the kit, run it locally, and then you can find the back ends, run it on the back end, and get yourself a, uh, some experience running it. And again, thinking about this in a practical term is if I've got Qiskit as an SDK, let's say I'm doing some, I don't know, regression analysis for financial services. Uh, and in the future, I'm, I want to be able to have one notebook that has, right, I'm going to farm this out to, to some mainframe machine learning optimized work, or I'm going to run this as on, on you know, going to get some data out of Kix or something like that. And then I want to run this particular part of the quantum machine. I want to run this on you know, some other thing we've not thought about yet, a stochastic or some other analog computing device. Um, and all of this can be done through these SDKs. So Qiskit is just an example of how to make this tractable. Um, I'm very conscious of time, so I'll, I'll get through this bit quite quickly, but it's broken up into these different areas. So Terra is the sort of the, the heart of it all. So Terra is really the core runtime for Qiskit um, and what you can do with it. And eventually it does all the um, quantum object generation, it does transpilation, so on and so forth. Um, air is all about understanding um, noise and it's understanding error propagation within the system. Aqua is effectively, um, it's basically the reuse of our algorithms, I suppose, in that sense is the right way to think about it. So it's more ways that we talked about some of those things. So things like the quantum support vector machines and those sorts of algorithms feature within that. Um, I should also say, sorry, air is also the back end. So it doesn't, it does deal with noise, but it, it's got all the sort of simulators and back ends and it does all the integration with the back end, uh, the, the physical topologies. And then Ignis on the right hand side there, again, that's a, a noise um, toolkit. So understanding propagation of errors. We've since added pulse control as well. So uh, these are microwave signaling systems. So going back to that, um, the, this picture we had of the machine with the, with the lid off, um, all of the signaling within that infrastructure is, um, is all done through microwaves. So the idea of being able to calibrate those pulses manually, that's something that we're starting to expose as well on some of the smaller volume systems. And um, so in terms of the quantum experience, this is what it now looks like. So just to wrap all the pieces together that we've talked about. So you've got your circuit composer here. We've got qubits um, pretty much running in. It looks like a score, like a musical score. So you effectively drag and drop in the gates that you want. So we've got an Adamar gate here. We've got uh, controlled not gates. And in fact, those are the only two gates we've got here. Apart from these guys, which are measurement gates. And you'll see these uh, effectively route to earth. And the earth here is just a, a classical register of uh, size N, and in this case, five. And effectively what we're doing is measuring the state of all of these qubits after computation. So they've done their work. And then this measurement gate collapses them uh, from a quantum state into a discrete classical state, which we can then encode in memory. And as these are individual bits, it's easy for us to do that. Um, we've added recently um, some work around uh, inline simulation. So for smaller circuits, you can see what it's predicting, uh, the probabilities are going to be on the out out output side. And it's doing that in line and then what the qubit state's likely to look like. Um, but then on the right, if you wanted to, you can see the chasm as well. If you so choose, and some people would, I'm one of them, um, it's a great fun language to learn, chasm, if you want to have a look at it. The, again, it's open source and it's, it's, um, there's really good documentation for it. Uh, if you're into your assembly languages, uh, why not, frankly? Um, I would encourage you to, to have a, a peekaboo at that. Um, and again, when you get the results back, um, one thing that we've added is you see your, your original circuit, if you like, um, but then you get the, the histogram of the results. Uh, in this case, it's partial up the results, but you'll notice um, that we're expecting the 00110 state, um, which is what we have got, but you'll notice it's not crisp. It's not like a classical machine where it's definitely 00110. And the reason for this is that yes, there's some noise, but as we say, these are physical systems. So you have this slightly odd sort of percentages for things that, that you know, are just propagation, just errors um, within the environment that we have to account for. But I mean, we can see clearly here with very, very high confidence that that is the state that the system's converged on. But we have to think about all of this kind of stuff and it's relevant and it's hopefully it's interesting, but it gives you a flavor of, of how all this sort of fits together. Um, so I suppose I'd wrap all of that up by three little boxes um, in that, to really be successful with quantum, I think you need to understand the sort of three things to it. So representations are 
how we approach our problems in a quantum native way. So what do I mean by that? Thinking about quantum information science, thinking about qubits, not bits, thinking about quantum logic gates and quantum operations, logical operations rather than their classical um, counterparts. Uh, and then once we've got that, we've then got the algebra to then think about methods. So methods in this case would be algorithms. This is where I can chain together those things, the sequence of stuff, what I want to do. Um, but over time, we underpin that with tradecraft, you know, sort of experience. So we build up basically a, a, um, an a, a experience as programmers, as software engineers, as technical people, as scientists, of how to use this stuff within the domains that we find interesting. So I think there's those three things sort of naturally fit together, but it's something that because we're so early on in all of this, it's something that we're still developing, but it's a fascinating field. I, mean, I, I hope you're starting to get a sense of that, if nothing else. Um, so you think, okay, that's all good. That makes a bit of sense. Um, I probably never want to look at this again, which is a valid conclusion. Um, but I would encourage you to think about this, which is um, apologies for the slightly low resolution picture on the right there. I hadn't realized that was quite so knobbly. Um, one thing that IBM is very interested in is this, this sort of future of computing. This is a main research topic for us. And one of the things that we've talked about is a future with bits, neurons, and qubits. So that's where we get this multimodal view of computing. So bits, yes, we're going to have classical systems, which includes mainframes, it includes system P, it includes Intel, and all those other sorts of things. Um, but then we think about neurosystems. So neurosynaptic hardware, calls things like that, where we are using non von Neumann computing architectures, stochastic machines, approximate con uh, machines, connection machines, things of that nature, which are currently you know, at the very cusp of, of research and development, but, but are going to play into this. Um, and then qubits, which we, we spent, I suspect, what feels like a longest proportion of your time talking about this evening. But again, it requires us to think differently about this stuff. And it's, I suppose, um, the combination of those things, just imagine what we can accomplish as scientists, as technologists, but as people by doing this, the sorts of problems that we can take on that are currently beyond um, the, the, the technology that we have. I find that enormously exciting because if, like me, you believe in the purpose of computing is to solve our problems, this has just got so much potential. Um, and on that note, where are we going with it? So this is a slide that IBM has published um, relatively recently about where we're going. And um, this is all to do with how we step up that quantum volume um, idea. So we've gone from, yeah, these, all of the, the chips, by the way, are, are named after, uh, these are all birds. Um, so these are the programs that uh, define um, all of these phases of work. So we're currently, you know, we've got the, the 65 qubit machine in the shape of the hummingbird architecture. And then next year, we're looking to move to 127, which uh, rather pleasingly is a power of two minus one. Um, but then yeah, beyond that, we're looking to 433. But this, once we get up to the thousand qubit layer, and this, this is the question most people ask is, how many qubits do we need to do something useful? Um, now, I would argue that doing anything with a quantum computer that's repeatable and a proper algorithm is useful. But I think what people mean by that is regular workloads or real world workloads. And once we start getting to a thousand qubits, we are starting to really, you know, cooking on gas at that point. Um, because you, the state spaces that you can model there within areas such as uh, computational chemistry and things like this become uh, substantial. Um, and again, beyond that, this idea of path to a million qubits, which is what we said we want to get to. So um, I think in the interest of time, <laughs> I think we'll park it there. I have been talking for quite a long time and I do hope, yeah, I genuinely do hope this has been useful for you. I, I really do thank you for your time. I know it's, um, it can be a dry topic and I suspect we may be at the wrong end of the day for many of you in terms of talking about bits and qubits and logic gates and quantum logic gates. But if nothing else, yeah, my enthusiasm for this is genuine and it's genuine because I really feel much as IBM was doing with the system 360, this idea of how do we redefine what we mean by computing, I think quantum is changing that again because it's giving us another tool in the box. It's giving us other opportunities to think about problem solving. It's giving us other opportunities to think about the sorts of problems that we really need to be solving. So I think on that note, I shall park it there and I'll leave the slide up for any discussion or questions you might have. But thank you ever so much, do appreciate it. Wow, thank you very much. That was incredible, really, really interesting. Um, we do have a couple of questions. So what I will do is unmute the people who have uh, asked them or at least ask them to unmute and they can ask you themselves. 
So, uh, number one, given the concern over current cryptography being broken by quantum, yeah, uh, is there any policing of what people are doing with the free use of your quantum kit to filter out any bad actors? Yeah, it's a good question, and it's not an uncommon question. And um, so, so just for everyone else's benefit, if you're not familiar, the one of the perhaps more published use cases for quantum computing is something known as Shaw's factoring algorithm, uh, named by Peter Shaw, fantastic computer scientist, possibly not the most imaginative in terms of naming conventions. Um, but uh, but P Peter Shaw for the last 25 years has had what we've known as the Shaw's factoring algorithm, which reduces the complexity of um, the search space of, uh, of factoring problems effectively. And it does this through uh, one quantum, particular quantum step, turns it into a period finding problem. Um, and the impact of this is that it, 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 it reduces the complexity of an operation that sits at the heart of public key cryptography. So if I give you a number and I tell you that, that number, which is large, is the product of two unique prime numbers that are by definition smaller, but still very large numbers, it's computationally intractable for you, given just the, the, the product, uh, to find the two factors. Now, the, 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 I think the thing I'd say about this is, yes, we do, of course, monitor the environment. And we don't just monitor that because for, for those sorts of reasons. But this is a, um, this is a developmental research-grade system. So we need to understand its behaviors and bits and pieces. I should also say that these systems are nowhere near the scale that would be required to do any of those sorts of operations. Um, and I should also, again, say that public key cryptography, as it's currently formalized, of course, predates quantum computing in terms of how we do um, particularly RSA style systems of, 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 of the type I've just described, um, of products of large primes. So things like you know, post-quantum crypto is, is an area that's very interesting. And even on mainframe, we've got work looking at things like lattice-based schemes. And in fact, one of my other research areas is looking at applications of homomorphic encryption, which is itself a lattice-based encryption scheme, which we believe such schemes are not vulnerable to attacks by quantum computers. So um, yes, we are concerned about that and industry is concerned about that. There are, I'm not a cryptographer. My days of doing cryptanalysis are far behind me. Um, but there are people, particularly on our Zurich side and our Yorktown side, who are heavily involved and actively engaged with the cryptographic community and the setting of standards in this area. Um, and it, of course, it's something that, that, that we are conscious of because we are, as with all new technologies, there's the opportunity for um, use and misuse. But just to just to be absolutely clear, the systems that we have at the time, at this time, are even with the projected numbers that we've talked about in terms of quantum volume, are nowhere near the scale that would be required to to, to attack these systems. Um, I mean, I think a lot of the, the the problems that people find with with conventional PKI systems are the problem are nothing to do with quantum. Um, they're typically problems that people have had implementing it poorly, which I, you know, or having problems with key management and certification processes and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, it's a very, very fair question and it's something that we're conscious of. Um, but I think there's, we are a way away from systems operating at, at, at that sort of resolution. And I think we should be, we should be heartened by the fact that there's a very, very strong research interest in academia and in industry and in government um, throughout the world looking at what post-quantum crypto looks like. And as I say, it's a problem that predates the work really that, that we are, um, that we're doing in quantum. Because we know about discrete log for a very long time. Fab, thank you. Another question, got one from Colin. I think you're unmuted if you want to Yeah, hi, it. hi Lee, thanks for that. That's Hello. really, really interesting. I guess this, this, is, this, is, this is almost like a, a low brain question for this time of day. So Lee, just asking really, have you got an example of a problem that you can solve with quantum computing that you couldn't, could never solve with um, traditional? Yeah, absolutely. So the best examples typically come from one of two areas. So it's either what we call combinatorial optimization or n-body simulation. So a, an example of a combinatorial optimization problem would be like a logistics route. Yeah. So the idea that... Um, because the real world is an analog thing, the number of routes that you could take to get from A and B just scales so, 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 so quickly that it will, it will break the bounds of classical computing quite, you know, quite, quite, quite quickly. So you have to start reducing the dimensionality of the problem. Um, so when you're doing logistics planning, if you're running, you know, for example, freight containers across the world and you're trying to, you've, you've got a ship that's got 40,000 containers on it and you've got 10,000 such ships, the dimensionality of that problem 
even in well-managed waterways or road transport networks or even rail networks, once you start factoring these things in, it becomes so large that the state space will exceed being able to model all of it, which is why when we build these systems at the moment and we do things like um, viability assessments and, and, and assurance, if you like, computational assurance, um, satisfaction criteria, things like this, you'll notice that they're always targeting parts of the supply chain rather than the entire supply chain. Um, there's a really good piece of work done by Volkswagen and one of our um, uh, other uh, computing companies, quantum computing companies, D-Wave, who looked at the state space of doing um, things like uh, logistics freight for um, moving trucks around. And it was something like, I mean, it was a huge number. I forget if it was, if it was two to the 200 and something um, states within that environment. And that's, you know, it's sort of atoms in the universe type problem at that point, it, it just gets silly. Um, so that's where quantum computing, because we have this exponential scaling of, of, of bits in terms of the, bit, the information encoding depth, but it's also the operations that we can use, that there are things that we can use um, in the gates that we talked about. So the Adamar gate, the controlled not gate, but also the poorly gates, the classical gates that we didn't really touch on to manipulate the state of that system that really brings those sorts of problems toward us. So that's, that's an example of the optimization side. Um, the end body simulation one is, is, is equally interesting. So that the people who are using this most at the moment, I think I'm right in saying, are people interested in chemistry. So computational chemistry. So things like modeling atomic bonds and um, things like that. And things like how electrons um, will flow through different materials. So for example, you know, material discovery and, and crystallography and those sorts of things. And why is this relevant? Well, of course, if we're trying to create more sustainable materials, um, where we don't have, you know, we either reduce the impact, the environmental impact of mining, or we want to look at the ability to create new synthetic materials to prevent um, ecological problems, or we actually want to make materials harder and stronger, but lighter or flexible and things like that. The ability to model these things actually is really, really hard um, because in classical machines, you just, you, you just have to start throwing things away really quickly. So, I mean, just earlier on, I mentioned, uh, this idea of doing alloy development. You know, if you've got 10 or 15 base elements in an alloy, actually quite quickly, you, that's just a, an enormously hard problem to solve. And these reduce to what we call n-body simulations. So in other words, I've got agents within a system, in this case, it's molecules who are interacting with each other in, you know, in some sort of uh, state. So that might be some substrate or a fluid or something like that. Um, and how would we do that? And, and another example is, um, uh, fluids, superfluid development, so things like better oils for machinery and uh, better fuels and so on and so forth. So it's, it's speaking to those sorts of workloads, which we know classically are just, you know, we, 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 have, to, we have to start throwing things away. So the completeness of the model is, is beyond what we can currently do. Whereas quantum, um, the, it's, it's not the case. Uh, we, we can model them more effectively. Another question, who decides the number of qubits in a quantum machine? Uh, 53, uh, 127. Yeah, I see what you mean. It seems like a sort of random number generator, doesn't it? Um, it's, it's, that's a very good question, actually. So I, the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I can tell you this, though. I'm pretty sure we don't set out with that number in mind, if that makes sense. So I think what happens is um, because when we've developed, we've been developing silicon semiconductor technologies for so long now, we're quite used to this idea of, well, we can, we, we just have to keep reducing and reducing and reducing. I mean, we've got what, seven nanometer transistor production now, I think, uh, for, for, for off the shelf systems. So you think, well, actually, I know it's gonna be this size of processor and I know it's got this layering and we've got um, different um, copper grids and lattices within it. So I know roughly what it's gonna give me. And, and effectively, we, we, we know what density we can get out of those chips. But with quantum, we, we don't. And some of it is to do with we have to change the physical topology of the machines to deal with error correction in different ways. So the errors propagate and the more, unfortunately, it's not one of those linear scaling problems. So you don't get twice the noise with twice the number of qubits. It's worse than that. Um, literally exponentially worse than that. Um, and you end up with a situation where the individual processors, because it's a function of how they're wired, of how they cool, of how they're put together, um, that really determines the number of qubits. But of course, the qubits then are just a, a part of that, that function that we evaluate to determine quantum volume. Um, and that's the, the really important part, I think, is, is to, to, to kind of get into that, because that tells us what size of problems that we can model. But I appreciate your point. It does seem like slightly odd numbers uh, coming out of it. But yeah, it's just because the technology is developing. And as we start to become better at that, we should 
uh, I suspect they'll become more more predictable. But it's a good question. I've not heard that before. But um, my understanding is that it, it's it's a function of of us just doing what we can <laughs> rather than um, it being entirely planned. I think it's probably the right way to put it. Okay. Uh, Christian has raised his hand. Um, there you go. Hello. Hello. Oh. You are in security, so uh, there is a lot of discussion, discussion now that uh, at some point penetration testing will be entirely done by machines. Do you think that this quantum computing, this quantum computer would be able to replace a human totally or it still, it still needs human input in terms of penetration testing and security, I mean? Oh, wow. I'll be honest. I've never had that question before. That's excellent. Um, so pen testing, obviously, well, I, 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 this is just my opinion. I should state this, <laughs> um, not the opinion of necessarily anybody else. I think um, there are some aspects of penetration testing that we can automate. Yeah. So there are things like vulnerability scanning, the ability to reconcile scan data with vulnerability data and various and CAPEC and uh, attack and things like that. But I think the really good pen testers are those which have exhibit strong human qualities. In other words, the ability to think creatively around problems that don't need to um, work through an environment that's entirely deterministic and so on and so forth. So I, I think I'd probably respin the question slightly in saying that do we envision a future in which information science um, and artificial intelligence is developed to the degree that it can deal with the uncertainty those sorts of environments and I think at the moment I, I don't think there's a there's any evidence to suggest that, that we would be replacing um, people with any form of artificial intelligence in those sorts of roles I, I don't I don't know that's just my my opinion just because the uncertainty when you're doing pen testing is you know it's, sometimes you just turn up and run a load of nmap scans and sometimes you actually really need to kind of think around a problem or something goes wrong and dealing with all of those uncertainties it's just it's just it's life right these things happen and i think i don't think there's anything necessarily in the quantum research which suggests that this is going to be a step change in that area i think there's an interesting question about penetration testing quantum systems um because one of the areas that i've been very interested in is um, if you think about how we do io validation so take something like the owasp top 10 that we would use as a benchmark for pen testing web applications most of the the top 10 that are in there in some way shape or form are to do with input validation or output validation so cross-site scripting cross-site request forgeries direct uh, insecure direct object references things like that um, the difficulty that you have of course is is inspecting input and output from a quantum system is very hard because as i mentioned earlier on you, you can't sort of snapshot the system in quite the same way um so it's an interesting problem um and i don't think anybody knows the answer to it um as i said before more research required definitely um, but i do think yeah i think that's an interesting area but i i can't i can't see why in my perspective i can't see what quantum would do to make um, or fully autonomous effective pen testing any more likely than the general development in other areas of machine learning, such as um, you know, game theory, deep learning and statistical methods. I don't think there's anything in there yet which suggests that this is, like, this is more or less likely as a consequence of quantum computing. Okay, thank you very much. Colin asks, sounds like driverless cars would be easier to control with quantum computing. Is that a way to go? Uh, that's an interesting question. So this, this speaks to um, decision theory or decision theory optimization. And I, if I understand your question correctly, if I was to generalize slightly, I think what we could say is because of the state spaces which quantum systems could process being larger, shall we say, than classical machines, I think there is some potential um, argument to that. Yeah, I think the problem you can have, of course, is where do you get the data from? Where do you get it to a quantum system? Because as we've talked about, these systems are very fragile, they're delicate. Um, quantum states, I mean, we're coming up to the, the festive time of the year. So I think of them as a glass bauble in the sense that they do have strength to them, but they're also very fragile. That strength is in a very small number of um, dimensions, whereas actually the, by and large, they're brittle, they're fractured, they'll break. So 
we are a long, 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 long way away, I think. Um, again, my opinion, not necessarily those of the corporation, um, from systems which are mobile in that way. And, I, and again, in, our, in the case of our systems, because of the superconductivity, we, we have to super cool them. Um, but I think it's an interesting question is if, if, you were, if you were looking at a generalized quantum dis, a decider, like an Oracle um, machine, then yeah, I, I think there is an interesting case there that says if you could evaluate a larger number of states or the largest number of states, and, uh, and I don't think this is just about driverless cars, it's anytime you have to do um, just any sort of decision theory problems or game theory problems, typically the, the more inclusive you can be of the state space without having to throw away underlying uh, components of the vector, if indeed it's a, a Hilbert space, the better. Um, I think generally, because at least then you know if that variable is any use to you. And I think one of the assumptions that we have to make in machine learning at the moment is we have to limit the dimensionality of our problems in such a way that they become lossy. It's a bit like data compression is that most data compression techniques people use are, are lossy. So we lose something in terms of resolution by compressing it. And so it goes with dimensionality reduction, whether that's principal component analysis, whether that's T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, whether we, all those sorts of things, linearization. Um, it's how we get to a, how you do that in quantum. I think that's an interesting question. It is an interesting question. So yeah, I think there could be an application there. Yeah. How you do it in practice, no idea. But uh, so, so, sounds like uh, sounds like a, an interesting idea. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Any other questions? Doesn't seem that way. Okay. Well, Lee, thank you very much. That was a fabulous keynote and really, really interesting. And I certainly think it's something for us to uh, consider in the future. So, Not at all. And thank I, you very much. Thanks everyone for their time. I, I really do, really do appreciate it because I've um, I'm a massive mainframe geek. So uh, uh, always, always have the opportunity to come and talk to, to fellow systems fans. So. Yeah, nice to hear the computer scientist as well. <laughs> okay. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Okay, cheerio.